My friends, hi, how's it going? Welcome to D4, D&D Deep Dive. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons & Dragons. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers about them, with the intent not to tell you the only way or the right or the best way to play a character necessarily, but to explore one potential option for building and playing a character in-game with the hopes of creating something that is both really powerful but also really fun to play. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on a character that you would like to play, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm really, really glad that you're here, so thanks for being here. My name's Colby. I feel like it's been a while since um, since I've recorded something, and for you, that's probably not the case, but I actually went out of town for a week uh, and enjoyed a nice spring break vacation with my family, but I was able to get some writing done while I was gone, so even though I didn't record last week, I still wrote an episode, and now I've kind of lost my buffer, but I'm still able to keep up on that weekly schedule, and you probably don't care about any of that. A couple of housekeeping things really quick. First up, I am going to be at PAX East in Boston um, at the end of April, the 24th through the 27th, or whenever the dates are. I'm really excited. I've never actually been to PAX before, and so it's going to be cool. I've got some old World of Warcraft guildies that live back east in the Boston area, and I'm going to be hanging out with them. That's really fun. And also, I'm going to be on a panel uh, with my friend from Extra Credits. So if you are in the area or considering going to PAX East, come check out the panel, come say hi. I'm not going to be like at a booth or anything otherwise, I'll just be probably walking around and eating good food and checking out all the cool nerdy stuff. So anyway, keep an eye out for me, I guess. And maybe I'll post something in the community channel to like meet up at a certain time at a certain place and we can say hi. So anyway, that'll be fun. Looking forward to that. Also, uh, merch. Yeah, you know, cool hoodie. Link in the video description for the merch store. It's it's pretty rudimentary, basic design stuff. Hopefully we'll get some stuff that's cooler and more complicated one day. But for now, we're keeping it simple. This hoodie's really soft and comfy though, so you should check it out. All right, let's jump in. A long time ago, like over a year ago, one of my very first episodes, I did a breakdown of what I thought were the highest damage dealing sustained spells in game uh, there. That is spells that you can cast once and then usually with concentration continue to do damage with them round after round. Until that time, I hadn't realized, I don't think, what a potentially potent spell Moonbeam could be. And ever since, I've wanted to build a character that focuses on trying to build around the Moonbeam spell. Now, to be sure, there are some drawbacks to the Moonbeam spell, but let's actually break it down a little bit. First off, it does 2d10 radiant damage, which is really quite good for a second level spell. Even better, it goes up by 1d10 for each level that you upcast it, making it one of the best scaling spells damage-wise in game. It does radiant damage, like I said, and that's nice because that's a damage type not frequently resisted by enemies in 5th edition. And it does have a small area of effect. It's only a 5 foot radius. That means it would be like a 2x2 two two on the grid if you snapped it to the grid anyway. But the best part about the spell, in my opinion at least, is that it has that wonderful magical wording that only a few lucky spells in D&D have. Namely, when a creature enters the spell's area for the first time on a turn or starts its turn there, they suffer the effects of the spell. Now, we've done builds in the past taking advantage of spells with this kind of wording, namely Cloud of Daggers, like in the Catch-22 build, or more recently Spirit Guardians in the uh, Nature Cleric build that I did a few weeks ago. But we've yet to try to build around Moonbeam in this regard. And it's actually a little ironic that I haven't used Moonbeam yet, because Moonbeam is the spell that prompted, I think, the Sage Advice Compendium entry to teach us how these, when a creature enters the spell's area or starts its turn there, spells work. 
mechanically. So let's review. Here's what the Sage Advice Compendium says about Moonbeam and spells with similar wording. And I'm quoting, Moonbeam, for example, creates a beam of light that can damage a creature who enters the beam or who starts its turn in the beam. Creating the area of effect on the creature or moving it onto the creature doesn't count. But if the creature is still in the area at the start of its turn, it is subjected to the area's effect. Also, entering such an area of effect needn't be voluntary. That's important. And then later, in summary, a spell like Moonbeam affects a creature when the creature passes into the spell's area of effect and when the creature starts its turn there. So, if we can move a creature into the spell's area of effect and they start their turn there, they can potentially suffer the spell's effects twice in one round. Capiche? Okay, so is Moonbeam better than, say, Cloud of Daggers for trying to take advantage of this tactic? I would say both yes and no. On the one hand, Moonbeam does potentially a little more damage. It's 2d10 versus 4d4 at second level anyway. But of course, the beauty with Cloud of Daggers is that there's no saving throw. The creature just takes the damage. With Moonbeam, they do get to save for half damage. And what's worse, they get to make a constitution saving throw or take half damage. And constitution is usually the worst saving throw to be targeting for us, since so many enemies in 5th edition have good bonuses to their constitution saves. That said, as we'll see when we get into the numbers, spells that do half damage on a save still put out pretty decent and, more importantly, I think, reliable damage. Think about it this way. Weapon attacks and spell attacks typically do full damage if they hit, but nothing if they miss, right? With saving throw based spells, barring damage immunity from the enemy, you are always at least doing some damage to them. And that's really fantastic. The other nice things about Moonbeam versus Cloud of Daggers, the area of effect for Moonbeam, though small, is still much bigger than Cloud of Daggers, which is only a five foot cube. More importantly, I think, Unlike Cloud of Daggers, Moonbeam can be moved on your turn with your action. And that's actually a pretty big deal. Because Cloud of Daggers is static and can't be moved once you cast it, I feel like it's really hard to build a character around the spell in a way that we could call it sustainable damage. Sure, you could do big damage with it a couple of times pretty reliably in a single round, but after the enemy that you're attacking dies or runs away, it's really hard to assume, I think, that you'll just be able to get enemies into the spell effect round after round. But with Moonbeam, since we can move it every turn, suddenly it's a lot easier to argue that you could reliably do at least some damage with it every turn. So yes, today we're going to try to build a sustained DPR character who uses Moonbeam for most of their damage. Though I need to put a little asterisk when I say sustained, as we'll discuss when I get into it. I'm also, though, really excited to be checking something else off my to-do list with the build today that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. Almost a year ago, I did a Twilight Cleric Circle of Stars druid that was a pure healer. And in that video, I said, one day I'm going to do a damage dealing character built around the Stars druid. Well, today is that day. And so I proudly present Episode 88, The Moon and Stars. Big thanks to Randall Hampton, as always, for the fantastic artwork that he puts together for each of my character concepts. I love this one. It reminds me a little bit of, like, Hank from the old 80s D&D cartoon. <laughs> it's so cool. I love the pose. I love the effect of, like, that archer cosmic arrow and the bow. It's awesome. Randall does fantastic work. If you're interested in following him, I will put links in the video description as always on how to follow him and uh, reach out to him. So thanks, Randall. Let's jump into the build. All right. At level one for our class, we are actually going to start off as a druid. Surprising many of you, I'm sure. There is some multi-classing that I plan on doing with this character, but I would just as soon start Druid, I think, both to establish like the story of this character, but also because I prefer the saving throw proficiencies that Druids get versus the other classes that we're going to be dipping into. So when we first meet our character, they are not just your typical nature-loving Stonehenge-building Druid, I think, but they are a Druid who seeks to harness the power of the cosmos. They've been trained to read the stars and to see portents in those visions. As for our race, I 
thought of trying to do like a gem dragonborn and go crystal dragon for our ancestry because we're going to be doing a ton of radiant damage and that just felt cool thematically or maybe even like the new asmr uh, coming out soon in monsters of the multiverse for similar reasons but at the end of the day I just really need a feat to make this build work, and it's hard to beat a free feat to bring a character online as quickly as possible. So yes, we're gonna go with Variant Human for this one. You could, of course, do Custom Lineage instead. There's just, there's not a half feat that gives us a wisdom bonus that I feel super strongly about with this build, though there are always some decent options, but I'm gonna take Variant Human to get plus one in two stats as opposed to plus two in one stat, but I can absolutely see you going Custom Lineage instead if you'd like to pick up like a nice half feat for this build. Most notably, I think, would be Telekinetic, um, but we will have a consistent use for our bonus action, so I'm gonna pass on Telekinetic, I think, this time, though I think there's a good argument for taking it. As for the free feat that we're going to pick up, we are going to take Crusher. Just in case you don't know, with Crusher, if you hit an enemy with an attack that does bludgeoning damage, you can move it five feet in any direction. Kind of oddly, not just push it away from you, but it can be any direction so long as the space you move it into is unoccupied and the creature is no more than one size larger than you. You also do get to add plus one to your constitution or strength score, and if you get a critical hit that deals bludgeoning damage, then all attacks against that creature are made with advantage until the start of your next turn. It's a fantastic feat as moving an enemy with damage just presents us with so many fun and powerful options. As for our ability scores, I assume point by, as always, I'd recommend starting with a 15 wisdom and taking one of your plus ones there, a 15 constitution and then taking the plus one from crusher there, so we've got 16 in both, a 13 charisma and taking your other plus one from your racial there, I think, and then a 12 dexterity. As for our equipment, I'd recommend going with the gold by route and picking up a shield, wooden shield, of course, hide armor, and then whatever other necessities you might have. I'm not going to get into the does will not wear metal armor mean cannot wear metal armor debate. I've done it in the past. Feel free to have that argument in the comments if you'd like. At our table, it's allowed. I'm just going to assume that you can't or have decided not to, which means that the best we can do for now is hide armor or studded leather, unless the studs in the studded leather count as won't wear metal armor. But if that's the case, then it makes me wonder what we're using for, like, buckles on our armor. Bone? Stone? I don't know. Anyway, that's going to put us at a 15 armor class, which isn't great. And it's actually kind of heavily influenced the way that I've decided to build this character, to be honest. More on that later. As a druid at level one, we get druidic, which is like the secret coded language that druids get to speak to each other, leaving sort of signs in the bushes. Um, anyway, and we do get spells, of course. As for which spells I'd recommend, you know, I'd get the usual suspects here, but not Guidance, because we're going to get that for free later. But so yeah, Healing Word, Good Berry, I mean, nothing that I'm going to plan on using for sustained damage here, so pick your favorites. And yes, many of the best Druid spells are Utility and Support spells, so even though we're building this character for sustained DPR, don't be afraid to, and in fact, please do, lean into those support and utility options you have because it will make you that much more versatile and fun and powerful to play, I think. I will maybe just make special mention of Thorn Whip here. Thorn Whip would give us another way to move enemies around on the battlefield, which could come in handy once in a while, especially with this build. You cast Thorn Whip as an action, you make a spell attack on an enemy within 30 feet, and if it hits, you do damage, and then you pull the enemy up to 10 feet towards you. I'm just going to say keep that arrow in your quiver. At level 2, Druids get Wild Shape, which tells us that twice per short rest we can transform into a beast of challenge rating one quarter or less. That scales later. They can't have a flying or swimming speed yet. Again, that changes later. There's a bit more to it than that, but I'm not actually planning on using Wild Shape to transform into a beast on this character, so I'm not going to go into further detail on it. For us, I think this will largely be used really only for utility. We need to squeeze through a hole in the wall so we turn into a mouse, something like that. And I mean, hey, sometimes that's really cool, right? Turn into a little house cat and 
spy on a conversation that your enemies are having without drawing attention to yourself, maybe. I don't know. Lots of fun, cool, useful uses for wild shape, just none that we're planning on using in combat. Because no, for us, our wild shape uses will largely be used for something else as at level two, druids get their subclass, their druidic circle, and as I said, we are going with the circle of stars. Let's read what Wizards of the Coast has written about Circle of the Stars. The Circle of Stars allows druids to draw on the power of starlight. These druids have tracked heavenly patterns since time immemorial, discovering secrets hidden amid the constellations. By revealing and understanding these secrets, the Circle of the Stars seeks to harness the powers of the cosmos. Many druids of this circle keep records of the constellations and the stars' effects on the world. Some groups document these observations at megalithic sites, which serve as enigmatic libraries of lore. These repositories might take the form of stone circles, pyramids, petroglyphs, and underground temples, any construction durable enough to protect the circle's sacred knowledge, even against a great cataclysm. So, as a stars druid, we get a cool little star map, first up, that's like a tablet or a scroll, etc., and can serve as a spellcasting focus for us also. In addition, while we're holding it, we know the Guidance Cantrip, awesome, and we have the Guiding Bolt spell prepared, and it's a Druid spell for us. And we can even cast Guiding Bolt proficiency bonus times per day for free without spending a spell slot. And you know what? I wasn't actually planning originally on making much use of Guiding Bolt in this build, but the more I thought about it, the more I decided that I really, really wanted to, because it's a pretty cool little feature. So let's do it. Guiding Bolt is a decent little first level spell. You cast it as an action, you make a ranged spell attack, and then it does 4d6 radiant damage again on hit. And then the next attack roll made against that target before the end of your next turn is made with advantage. Now, 4d6 isn't crazy damage, but it's not half bad. It does upcast by 1d6 per spell slot, but I'm not going to assume that we're upcasting this when I crunch the numbers, because I am trying, as I said, to make a sustained damage build. And I have to assume that the you can cast this proficiency bonus times per day without spending a spell slot means that we can cast it at the first level in this way. And this brings me to the little asterisk that I said I had to include when talking about this character being a sustained damage dealing character. As I've said many times in the past, my goal when building characters for sustained damage per round is to spend as little resources as possible in order to do consistent damage, but the minimum requirement is that you're able to do the level of damage we calculate for at least an entire combat encounter. Now, currently, we could cast Guiding Bolt at the first level twice for free, our proficiency bonus is two, and then three more times with our spell slots, giving us five first level castings per day. Most combat encounters last four to six rounds, so, I'm gonna say this meets our minimum requirement for a sustained damage build, but yeah, barely. Not super sustainable, I get it. At least not yet. That will get much better as we level, and of course we will have more than just first level spell slots, right? As well as cantrips, of course. But still, just be aware of this little asterisk when we talk about sustained DPR here, right? And we also, as a Stars Druid, get the super awesome Starry Form feature here, which tells us that as a bonus action, we can expend a use of our wild shape and take on a starry form, causing our body to become luminous with glowing joints and lines that connect them, as though we were like a heavenly constellation. We otherwise retain all of our game statistics, but can choose between one of three starry forms to take on. Chalice form lets us add 1d8 plus our wisdom modifier in healing whenever we heal with a spell. And that's something that I've actually used a couple times now on some different builds. Dragon form lets us treat anything rolled lower than a 10 on an intelligence, wisdom, or concentration check to be treated instead as just a 10. And that's situationally really nice, but we are here, yes, for the archer form, which tells us that as a bonus action, we can make a ranged spell attack hurling a luminous arrow that targets one creature within 60 feet of us, doing 1d8 plus wisdom modifier radiant damage, again, on a hit. And that's a decent little weaponized bonus action, but also just so on point for us thematically, for the way that I envision this character, right? A ranged damage dealer who's hurling 
multiple bolts of luminous radiant energy at enemies each turn to great effect. Keep in mind, of course, that if you hit with Guiding Bolt first, this bonus action attack from Archer would be made with advantage, and that's nice. At level three, I want to take a level or maybe two of Warlock with this build. I'm not 100% sure when the best time to do it would be, frankly. I'm going to take it now, but you can delay it, I think, maybe at least till next level uh, instead. I want to be able to establish what we're going to be doing in combat tactically, as soon as possible, so I'm going to go ahead and take it now. But I also like the story twist that it throws into our character early on in our career. More on that in a second. As a warlock, at level 1, of course we get spells. I'm probably going to pick spells that either just work or that are utility and or support focused, since warlock spells depend on our charisma to work well, and our charisma is only a 14, right? So Eldritch Blast is not going to do a lot for us. But Minor Illusion might, or Prestidigitation, Armor of Agathis to improve our survivability and return some damage if we get hit in melee. Things like Comprehend Languages provide some nice utility. Those, I think, would be my go-to type spells for this character. Do keep in mind that though Warlock's spell slots and spell slots from other classes don't mix, Warlock spell slots do reset on a short rest, which is really nice for us since we're trying to get as many castings of Guiding Bolt as we can in a day, right? We only have one Warlock spell slot currently, but considering that we're going to be able to use it at least a couple of times a day, most likely, if not more, thanks to it resetting on a short rest, makes me feel a little better about the sustainability of our damage. But the real reason that we're here in Warlock is because at level one, Warlocks get their otherworldly patron, their subclass, and we are going to take, yes, the genie patron. And as a genie warlock, we have to choose what kind of genie our patron is, and of course, we are going with Dao. So the burning question that must be answered here, I think, is this. Why is your head in the clouds, fascinated with the heavens and the cosmos druid, suddenly making a pact with the noble genie of the earth? Perhaps they were simply tricked into service or maybe coerced into service. An earthquake swallowed up the library where your fellow druids' starry records were kept, and in order to exhume it from the depths, you had to make a pact with this Dao genie that agreed to bring it up from the dregs of the earth in exchange for your commitment to let them be your patron. My preference, I think, would be something like your circle, fascinated as they are with the cosmos, captured a great Tao who they vanquished in battle maybe many years ago. Sort of an old like sky realm versus earth realm war that is waged for centuries perhaps. For whatever reason, you have now been entrusted with this genie's care or maybe they tricked you into freeing them. I don't know. I really love the juxtaposition between the heavens and the earth in this character here, and I think it could make for some really great character development and even potential character conflict, which always makes for a great story, right? But as a Dao genie warlock, we get access to some additional spells, which I'm not going to get into as I won't plan on using them during combat, but you might. But we also get the genie's vessel feature, which I just love. So you're given a ring or a lamp or a bottle, etc. from your genie, which you can as an action, once per day, enter into for two times our proficiency bonus hours. At this level, it's not much more than a nice little resting place for you that can essentially serve as a humongous bag of holding or like a bank vault almost. But most importantly for us is the genie's wrath feature, of course, which tells us that once per turn, when we hit with an attack roll, it doesn't have to be a weapon attack. We can deal extra damage equal to our proficiency bonus, and because we are a Dao genie, that extra damage is bludgeoning damage. So yes, when we hit with an attack, we can add bludgeoning damage and thus trigger our crusher feet and move our target. Thus, at level four, we'd go back to Druid, and here's where it all sort of comes together. Because at Druid two, we get second level spells, and that means, yes, we get Moonbeam. In addition, of course, to all of the other great options here, like Pass Without a Trace, 
lesser restoration, hold person, heat metal, healing spirit, spike growth, but moonbeam is what we're building around. I've pretty much explained already how it works in the preamble, so I'm not gonna repeat myself here, but it's just such a fitting spell for this celestially focused character, I think, and I love it. Now we can be bringing down radiance from the sky in a big pillar and hurling radiant bolts at our enemy, pushing or pulling them back into that moonlit radiance, ideally, and it is glorious. At level five, we would be a druid four, and we get our first ability score, increase or feat seeing as how pretty much all of our damage is going to be improved by increasing our wisdom, not to mention the buffs and the healing that we get from it as well. I think we'd be crazy not to cap wisdom before taking other feats or ability score increases personally, so we're gonna bump our wisdom to an 18 here. And at level six, the reality with this character is this. I don't think anything is going to do more for our sustained DPR than just upcasting Moonbeam. Thus, if we were to consider any more multi-classing, we should be very, very careful, I think, about taking levels in anything other than a full caster, so as to not hamper our spell slot progression at the very least. So with that in mind, there is another class that I'd like to dip into here that some of you are not gonna like, and it's Cleric, namely Peace Cleric. I know, many of you think it's overpowered. I don't necessarily disagree. If you'd rather skip Peace Cleric, go right ahead. It won't actually have a huge impact on this build one way or another. But for us, I'm thinking that perhaps the patronage of our Dao Genie has started to weigh on our character. This Dao may have an evil or at least particularly violent bent to their own desires, I think and it started to affect us. As such, we might be seeking solace here in a temple of Eldath or Rao to recenter ourselves or perhaps just learn some meditative techniques from a fellow cleric party member to help us maintain the balance between the violent pull of our patron and our own personal goals and desires. Whatever your reasons, yes, we're taking a single level of cleric here. So we get spells, of course, and there is a fair bit of redundancy between low level cleric and druid spells. So I'm just gonna say, pick your favorites with maybe the exception of the Toll the Dead cantrip. Now that we're past level five, Toll the Dead will do 2d12 damage to an enemy if they fail their wisdom save. And that will be a decent backup damage-wise to the Guiding Bolt spell if you're out of uses of Guiding Bolt. It doesn't have the nice you get advantage on the next attack kicker, nor would it count as an attack and so wouldn't benefit from the Dao extra damage and thus Crusher. But it's something, and we still, of course, could use that Dao damage and push our target with our Archer form attack if that hits. At level 11, Toll the Dead will actually outpace Guiding Bolt by itself for pure damage, as it will go to a 3d12, right? I guess I'll also make mention of the Word of Radiance cantrip. It could be a nice little AoE cantrip to use in a pinch if you're surrounded by lots of weak enemies, I suppose, and it just it sticks with our Radiant theme. And of course, Bless and Bane are worth consideration as well for some nice support and or debuff options. Do keep in mind that because we multiclassed into Cleric, now we do have third level spell slots if we wanted to upcast Moonbeam. Oh, we want to. But the main reason that we're here, of course, is for the benefits of the subclass that Clerics get at first level, their Divine Domain, and as I said, we're going with the Peace Domain. As such, we get some bonus spells, a bonus proficiency, and the Emboldening Bond feature, which tells us that proficiency bonus times per day, we can choose proficiency bonus number of creatures, so three currently, including ourselves, and as an action, bond them together magically. Then for the next 10 minutes, so long as you remain within 30 feet of each other, you can add a d4 to one attack roll, ability check, or saving throw per turn. Is this powerful? Sure. It's kind of like a poor man's bless spell, but that doesn't require a spell slot or concentration. I really wanted a way to increase our chance to hit with Guiding Bolt, since if it hits, our Archer form attack gets advantage. But Guiding Bolt itself could use a little bump 
to the chance to hit. Now we could use another use of our wild shape to summon a familiar, like via the find familiar spell. That's a new feature that druids get post Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. But since we only get two per short rest, I mean, maybe if at your table, you usually only have one combat encounter per short rest, might be worth considering. And then you could get advantage on your guiding bolt. Maybe Peace Cleric Dip wouldn't be so necessary. But, you know, Emboldening Bond does require our action to use. It has a limited number of uses, and it can only benefit us once per turn. It's very good, but honestly, there will be plenty of times when we're not going to be using it, whether because we're just out of uses or we just don't want to spend an action to get it up and going. Let's discuss in our first damage report here at 6th level. So here's how I envision it all working. Ideally, if possible, we'll have Emboldening Bond up when combat begins. I appreciate that won't always be possible, but considering that it lasts 10 minutes and it isn't a spell, so it doesn't seem to need any kind of verbal component, it can't be counterspelled, etc. I'm going to assume when I crunch the numbers that it's up. If combat breaks out and you don't have it going, I might not take an action to get it going, honestly. That's going to depend on your current resources, on your party members, who you're fighting, etc. But anyway, on round one, we would want to cast Moonbeam as our action, potentially at the third level, right next to our target, not on them, right? Whether behind them, in front of them, or to the side, it doesn't really matter because with the Crusher Feet, we can move them in any direction, right? Then, as a bonus action, we'd use Starry Form, change to Archer Form, and make an attack. We can do so with the same bonus action that we use to transform. That's nice. Assuming we hit, we add our Dao bludgeoning damage, which activates Crusher, and we move them into Moonbeam, dealing Moonbeam damage. Then on their turn, they're going to take damage for being in Moonbeam right at the beginning, and then move out, I'm assuming. Now, in a perfect world, they won't be more than five feet outside of the Moonbeam spell. So it's important to talk with your allies here, I think, and encourage at least one of like your beefier melee allies to position themselves five feet outside of the area of effect, encouraging the enemy that's in Moonbeam to move up to them and attack them on their turn. You don't really want to be the one to position yourself there because of your low armor class and because all of your attacks are going to be ranged attacks and you don't want the disadvantage that having an enemy within five feet of you would impose. That said, if you don't love how this feels, tactically, and or you would prefer to mix it up in melee with your archer form, and or you want to be a straight druid with no multi-classing, stay tuned. In the final thoughts, I'm actually going to go over an alternative to this build that does all of those things. It's straight druid and a melee focused one as well, but who's still a star druid. For us, Assuming that the enemy has moved outside of Moonbeam, on our turn we hit them with Guiding Bolt, applying the Dao damage, pushing them back into Moonbeam for more damage, and then following up with an Archer attack, Rinse Repeat. Obviously, if no enemy is in our Moonbeam or just outside it on our turn, we can move Moonbeam and then push them in. Alternatively, if there's one enemy just on like the other side of your Moonbeam spell, let's say within 10 feet, and another within five feet of it otherwise, we could Thorn Whip as an action on one, dragging them into Moonbeam, and bonus action Archer Form on a second, using Crusher to move them in as well. But assuming the ideal scenario, as always, against just a single target here, I'm just going to calculate for single target damage that the Moonbeam area of effect is just too small to assume otherwise, I think. We would do 3d10 for Moonbeam twice, once on their turn, once on ours, right? Plus 4d6 for Guiding Bolt, plus 1d8, plus our Wisdom Modifier for our Archer Form attack, plus 3 for our Dao damage on the first attack that lands for a total of 4d6 plus 1d8 plus 6d10 plus 7. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their constitution saving throw, we would do 55 damage per round on average. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class and a plus 5 to their save, it would be 48 DPR. And that is really solid damage, putting us right near the top of tier 1 when compared to other sustained DPR builds that I've done to date at this level. Check the video description to see those graphs and comparisons, though I do appreciate that it won't always work out perfectly on the battlefield in this way to help you get these numbers every single round, right? Especially if you tend to have a lot of combats per day at your table. But even if you're needing to move Moonbeam on your turn and use cantrips for your action, it's still going to be solid damage. 
and more importantly, I think, a lot of fun. At level 7, we would be a druid 5, and that means we get third level druid spells. So, yeah, sure, take conjure animals. I mean, you've got to have something to fall back on if you run into radiant damage immune enemies, right? Then you'd probably end up doing more damage with this spell than with everything else we've worked so hard to achieve. Stupid spell. <laughs> but yes, revivify, dispel magic, plant growth, etc. Pick your favorites. Um, again, lots of great choices for control, utility, and support as usual, and Though some of you will be tired of hearing it, don't forget to lean into those options when you can and when it's needed. But yeah, nothing that I would plan on using here for sustained DPR anyway. At level 8, we'd be a Druid 6, and as a Stars Druid, we get the Cosmic Omen feature. And it's actually quite good, something that I really wanted to get in my re-roller build that I did a while back. At the beginning of the day, you roll a die. If you get an even number, then proficiency bonus times per day, you can use your reaction to add a d6 to an ally's attack, saving throw, or ability check. And if you roll an odd number, then proficiency bonus times per day, you can subtract a d6 from an enemy's attack, saving throw, or ability check. Unfortunately, you have to do this before the roll is even made, but it's still a really cool, fun, and potentially powerful ability to use when something really needs to work or really needs to fail. You do have 4th level spell slots as well now for 4d10 moonbeam damage if you want. I want. At level 9, we'd be a druid 7, and we get 4th level druid spells. Some of my favorite druid spells are 4th level spells. Divination really adds to the read the omens in the stars thing that you've got going on here. Polymorph, of course, Wall of Fire, Dominate Beast, Blight for some decent area of effect burst damage. Again, nothing that I'm going to plan on using for sustained damage, so PYF. For our level 9 damage report, nothing has really changed for us tactics-wise. We've simply gained a proficiency bonus, a lot of potential support, control, and utility, and we can now upcast Moonbeam to 4d10, as I said, if we wanted to, which in and of itself will provide some nice damage scaling should we choose to burn a 4th level spell slot on a lowly 2nd level spell. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their saving throw, we would do 67 DPR on average, and against an enemy with a 16 armor class and a plus 6 to their saving throw, it would be 57 DPR. We have slipped just a tad compared to other sustained DPR builds at this level, landing us more kind of middle of the pack, tier 1, and yes, with the same asterisks as before. With our better proficiency bonus now and all of the spell slots that we have available, I do feel a little better about being able to keep up this level of damage, or even better maybe if we're using second level spell slots for Guiding Bolt, right? Or maybe Thorn Whipping a second enemy into Moonbeam. But yeah, this level of damage for maybe a couple of combat encounters per day now. But sure, it's still more like semi-sustainable, I think. Unless you're playing at our table, where we really do tend to have one or two combat encounters per long rest most of the time. And then you get one day from hell where you have like seven, and you blow all of your resources in the first two combat encounters, and you're left just throwing rocks <laughs> for the rest of the time. That's rough. At level 10, we would be a Druid 8, and we get another ability score increase or feat. And again, I think priority number 1 is bumping wisdom, so we're going to cap it here at 20. And then we do have 5th level spell slots now for upcasting Moonbeam. At level 11, we'd be a Druid 9, and we get 5th level Druid spells. So many good and fun and really fairly unique 5th level Druid spells. Things like Tree Stride, Anti-Life Shell, Awaken wrath of nature. And then of course there's greater restoration, gesh. Nothing that we're going to plan on using for sustained damage, but know your options and use them to benefit your entire party. Pick your favorites. At level 12, we'd be a druid 10 and we get twinkling constellations. This is a really fantastic feature for star druids. Not only does our damage from archer form and healing from chalice form scale a bit going from a 1d8 to a 2d8, but Dragon Form now gives us 20 feet of flying speed, including hover, which is nice in case we get knocked prone while we're in the air or something. Most potently, I think, 
while in our starry form we can now change which form we are in at the beginning of each turn without even needing to use a bonus action or a reaction or anything to do so. This versatility is really pretty incredible. Did an ally just go down? No worries. Switch to chalice form before your turn and throw a big heal on them before going back into archer form next turn for more damage. Got an enemy up on a ledge behind full cover, swap to dragon form, fly up to get him. I just really love the options this gives us in combat, and it will make the already great versatility you bring to the battlefield as a druid that much more powerful and fun. Remember, we do have 6th level spell slots now too for upcasting. But at level 13, I think with Twinkling Constellation secure, I would probably take one more dip back into Warlock with this character. There's, there's not a lot more scaling our damage will get with more Druid levels, aside from higher spell slots of course, and I think it worth a quick detour to pick up some nice things from one more Warlock level. In fact, I can actually see taking this dip a lot sooner with this character, maybe right after Warlock 1 even. Maybe going Druid 3 first, then 2 levels of Warlock then back to druid though that would have slowed down our dpr by just a smidge so maybe at this point in your character's career there's there's a new agreement that must be entered into with that dao maybe you're in a bind and you need a little more power and you have to sacrifice or bind yourself a little bit more tightly to them not something that you love but as a warlock too we get eldritch invocations which means we can take the Eldritch Mind invocation and get advantage on our concentration checks. Since we don't have constitution saving throw proficiency and just a good but not great 16 constitution, and so much of our damage is coming from Moonbeam, which is a concentration spell, there's a really good argument for getting to this sooner. Since we are a ranged damage dealing character, I worried about it a little less, but yeah, get this sooner if you want. As for the second invocation that we get, I'm going to say pick your favorite. If you don't have good magical armor by now, um, you could take Armor of Shadows, which lets you cast Mage Armor at will. That would give you a small bump. There's plenty of others to consider, though. Devil's Sight, Fiendish Figure, etc. The other reason why I wanted to get Warlock 2, though, is because we would then get a second Warlock spell slot. And having two first level spell slots that reset on a short rest just feels a lot better than one. And it makes me feel like our damage is a lot more sustainable now than it once was with our higher proficiency bonus, more first level spell slots, two warlock spell slots that reset on a short rest. We can cast Guiding Bolt a lot more frequently than we used to be able to. For our level 13 damage report then, our tactics haven't changed all that much still, but we've capped our wisdom. We've gotten another proficiency bonus bump. We've added a d8 of damage to our archer form attack and can potentially cast Moonbeam as a 6th level spell now for 6d10, not to mention the nice defensive, support, and utility features that we've picked up as well. So, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their constitution saving throw, we would do 96 DPR on average, and against an enemy with a 17 and a plus 7, it would still be 82, showing again, like I said at the beginning, that even if they make their constitution saving throw, we're still gonna be doing pretty solid, reliable damage. And yeah, we're still holding strong at about mid tier one compared to other builds at this level. And again, feeling a lot better about our ability to sustain that level of damage for at least a couple of combat encounters per day, if not more. Especially considering that we could be using Toll the Dead for 3d12 instead of Guiding Bolt, right? And yeah, with the understanding that as a druid, we very well might be pausing the Radiant Devastation to heal or cure an ally. And if so, that's awesome. But at level 14, we're coming down the home stretch, and I can at this point actually see the character taking a few paths. I mean, another Cleric level would get us Channel Divinity, and that could mean turning undead, or another nice healing option from Peace Cleric, or even just recovering more spell slots via Harness Divine Power and it wouldn't even slow down our spell slot progression, right? Worth considering. I can also see us maybe going just one more level into Warlock for both second level Warlock spells and spell slots resetting on a short rest and a Pact Boon. And I'd probably take Pact of the Chain, I think, to have an invisible familiar giving us advantage on our Guiding Bolt attacks, among other things. That would be awesome. But 
knowing that I'm going to stop this build at level 17 like I always do, I personally really wanted to get back and stick to Druid for the rest of this character's career. For one, because I think of this character as having like a firm grip on the relationship with their Dao patron, not giving in to any further temptation of more power. But mechanically, I really wanted to get to the Stars Druid like capstone feature with this build as well. And so we would be a Druid 11 at this level. We'd get sixth level spells. And I mean, so many good ones. Bones of the Earth, so cool. You cause six pillars to rise up out of the ground underneath your enemies right and if and if you're in a room with a ceiling that's lower than 30 feet you just smash the enemy between the pillar and the ceiling dealing damage and restraining them if they fail their save come on that's so cool but yeah druid grove heal for a massive heal hero's feast so good transport via plants for some serious teleporting around the world nothing that i'm going to use when crunching numbers but so many awesome options Pick your favorites. At level 15, we'd be a druid 12. We get another ability score increase or feat, and with our wisdom score capped now, I think I'm probably looking to shore up my defenses. I can see taking the tough feat for a lot more hit points, or taking resilient constitution for constitution saving throw proficiency and thus concentration checks, right? Or maybe even compromise and just bump your constitution by two to get to 18 to give a little benefit to both our hit points and our saving throws. You decide. Keep in mind we do have 7th level spell slots now as well. At level 16, we'd be a druid 13 and we get 7th level spells. Not a huge list to choose from, but a lot of potent ones. Reverse gravity is probably my favorite for both power and hilarity. Um, Firestorm is potentially potent. Regenerate will be fantastic when you need it. Plane shift if you really need to get to another plane of existence. PYF. And then finally, for us, at level 17, we'd be a druid 14, and we get full of stars. This is the stars druid, like, capstone ability that I mentioned, and it's a pretty good one. While in your starry form, you have resistance to all bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, whether it's magical or not, and as we've discussed many times on this channel, that tends to be the vast majority of damage that characters are subject to in 5e at most tables in most campaigns. And that is a very welcome boon considering how low our armor class probably is and our decent but not great hit points. This is going to indirectly help with our concentration checks as well, right? And we also do get 8th level spell slots as well now for 8d10 of moonbeam damage. So for our damage report, our final damage report, the only real increases come are coming from our proficiency bump and our potential ability to upcast Moonbeam to 8d10, like I said, if we wanted. You might be crazy to do so. But again, considering that the vast majority of our damage now is coming from Moonbeam and that we can potentially do that damage twice on a turn, I'd at least consider it, depending on the fight. Speaking of foolishly upcasting low-level spells, some of you may be thinking that it'd be pretty easy for us to be upcasting Guiding Bolt now, at least occasionally with like a second or third level spell slot, and shouldn't we be trying to add that into our damage calculation somehow? Nah, I'd consider it, you know, if I were out of first level spell slots and warlock spell slots and proficiency bonus free uses, I suppose, but an extra d6 or two of damage is really not a lot at this level. The main reason that we're using it is to try and push an enemy into Moonbeam and give ourselves advantage on our Archer form attack. You know, in fact, Thorn Whip now at this level does 4d6 damage, the same amount as Guiding Bolt. And so you might want to just consider Thorn Whipping instead of Guiding Bolting, Guiding Bolting, just to conserve those spell slots, right? especially if that's going to let you get a second enemy into the area of effect. But against an enemy here with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their constitution, saving throws, we would do on average 121 DPR. We broke the centennial barrier. And against an enemy with an 18 armor class and a plus eight, it would still be 100 right on. And although our scaling has plateaued a bit as we've leveled, we're still tier one compared to other sustained DPR builds at this level, though maybe sort of bottom half of tier one now. Still incredibly strong if we can get everything going like we want and 
need. And so, final thoughts. The tier score for this character, if you average all of the damage that we do at all of the enemy armor classes and saving throws that we calculated for at each of the damage reports, is 73, putting us comfortably in the middle of tier 1, right between the original Hexblade character that I did, episode 1, and the Death Cleric, whose damage was being dealt to two enemies per turn. But in fact, compared to just other single DPR builds, the only ones that I've done to date that do more sustained damage per round are the Cheese Grater and the Blade Singer. So yeah, I love this character. I love the story. I love the versatility and variety. And I love being a druid that can do really solid damage because they have such great support and utility spell options that it's almost like you wouldn't be a jack of all trades, master of none, you'd be like a master of all trades. Especially, I think, once we can jump between starry forms at will. And I mean, of course, as I've sort of said a couple of times, there will be plenty of times, I think, when you'll be able to get two or maybe even three enemies into the area of effect of Moonbeam. And that would make the total damage numbers anyway that I've calculated a lot higher, of course. Maybe I've undersold this build. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> I did promise an alternative build here in the final thoughts that's both a little more melee but also a straight druid without any multi-classing. So let me summarize it here really quickly. Basically we'd be using the shillelagh cantrip and making quarterstaff wisdom based attacks. We'd want to pick up the polearm master feat I think in addition to crusher and probably find a way to get booming blade via either a race that gets a wizard cantrip like an elf for example, or maybe a feat like Magic Initiate. But in combat, then we would shillelagh before the fight, um, ideally before combat breaks out. And it is a cantrip with a one minute duration, so you could potentially be just casting it all of the time, unless that would cause your DM to strangle you. But then, anyway, in combat, you're casting Moonbeam, and then your enemy is moving up to you. You're standing, you know, five feet away from where the Moonbeam spell ends, right? And ideally, the enemies taking Moonbeam damage on their turn, moving up to you, you're hitting them with a reaction, thanks to Polearm Master, and then we're probably taking some damage. <laughs> but then on our turn, we would Booming Blade with our action and use Crusher to push them back into Moonbeam. And now, since they are no longer within five feet of you, you use your bonus action Archer Form attack to hit them for some additional damage. And then assuming that on their next turn, if they're still alive, they're moving up to you again to try and attack you. They're going to take that booming blade damage for moving, right? Going this route is potentially as much or actually maybe a little bit more damage per round on average, especially if you can get that booming blade movement damage. But it kind of requires them to move up to attack you, which they might not always do. And... If and when they do, you're probably going to be getting hit with your low armor class. It would be fun to try out, I think. Um, it's pretty feet heavy to really get going, but I think it could be a fun kind of glass cannon build, which as you guys know, I'm not at all opposed to playing. I think I'd probably be a lot more prone to try this if your druid could wear metal armor and thus have a better AC. So yeah, it's a little more high risk, high reward, but it's also a bit more sustainable because you're less reliant on using Guiding Bolt and thus potentially burning through spell slots. I do think it would work best if you had someone else in your party who was able to provide you protection and or damage reduction for you or healing or all of the above, right? But again, I am really pleased with the Stars Druid we ended up with. They truly call on the power of the moon and the stars for massive, consistent radiant damage and bring so much support and utility to boot that I just can't wait to play them in game. And I hope you get to very soon as well. So anyway, that's the build for the week. I love you guys. You're so awesome. Thank you for watching and liking and commenting and subscribing and all of those things. I hope you have a wonderful day and a fantastic week and that you're good and kind and safe. And I hope to see you again really soon. But until then, take care. Bye. Whoa.
I got some sun in Arizona. I'm looking a little Oompa Loompa-ish. <laughs> the stars are ours tonight. They sparkle and shine so bright. Because you're mine tonight. The stars are ours. <laughs> Microphone problems. The moon that's up in the sky is shining for you and I. Because you're mine tonight. The stars are ours. Oompa loompa doopa dee doo. I've got another puzzle for you. Don't even say that. Where did it go? Come on, come back to me. I lost it. Or, <laughs> don't say that. Since we. <clears throat> druid, uh, seventh level druid spells. And I mean, we, we very rarely even talked about, well, we kind of actually did talk about that, so don't say that. Mm, I think I might be out of cards. Power and hilarious and, <laughs> um, I think that's true. Unless I'm wrong. In which case, ignore everything that I just said. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right. Of course I'm right. <laughs> I'm never wrong. Ever. <laughs>